In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Father, thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your faithfulness to us. Father, thank you for loving us and for always leading us and never letting us be alone. Father, we ask for your spirit to be poured out in us that we may live your will and do as you command because you command it in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. I thought I'd uh, deal with the sacraments, and we'll start with baptism, of course. But just an overall thing about the sacraments first. You know, again, when I was a kid, uh, and most of you were kids, it was very explicit, the definition of a sacrament, huh? Uh, An outward sign instituted by Christ that gives grace. And so an outward sign means it's something you touch, you feel, you experience, water. You know, we are tactile people, human beings. um, We like to experience things physically. So that's what it is. It's an outward sign. It's a physical sign, something that touches us. Uh, Christ instituted it, instituted it. Mm. (laughs) It came from Christ. He brought it forth uh, either implicitly or explicitly in the gospel, and it gives grace. And grace is the way God touches us. And so today, uh, we're going to just deal with baptism because it's something that most of us have received. And it's the first sacrament. It's the uh, a great sacrament because it institutes, a, it institutes us. What the heck today? It uh, brings us into union with Jesus. And No other sacrament can happen unless we're baptized. And I just think that we really take it for granted. And this is the sacrament we should never take for granted, that we should be uh, grateful for it and that we should live our baptism every day of our life. So to go with very simple, what's the outward sign of baptism is, of course, the water. The outward sign is water or liquid, um, It's instituted by Christ in the place in the Bible, of course. Uh, One place, anyway, the most explicit, this is the most explicit sacrament there is about institution, is in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Behold, I am with you always until the end of the world. So here Jesus Christ explicitly uh, tells us to baptize, and he tells us how to do it. He gives us the formula. And this is the way we're incorporated into God. And later on, Paul would say, when we're baptized, we're baptized into the death of Jesus. And when I was in major seminary, Just that one thought, baptized in the death of Jesus, I just didn't really get it. And we had a professor then in major seminary, and uh, I literally called him a heretic. I'm so arrogant sometimes. When I was, uh, I was, I was more arrogant, believe it or not, when I was younger. And um, so we, I remember him saying something, not something like he said explicitly this. God became that which he absolutely is not when Jesus died on the cross. And so for me, that was a hard reality. How can God become that which he is not? How is that even possible? And again, uh, I later found out as I became a priest and, um, you know, in the, in the readings and the, uh, the Psalms and the prayers, one of the prayers talks about how God became that which he is not. And, The reason is because God is life. And on the cross when he died, God became death. Jesus became death on the cross. He became that which he was not. God who is relationship become non-relationship. And then what the Father did with Jesus is he embraced Jesus in his death. And his love was so great it brought resurrection life. And so when we are baptized into the death of Jesus, that means we become one with Christ in his death where he paid the penalty for our sins. But that's, that's more than that. For God the Father t- 
to let go of us now. He has to let go of Jesus because we are baptized into his death. And the Father would never let go of Jesus. Isn't that something? Isn't that a profound thought when you think about it? So that's why it's always about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. So when we become one with Jesus, again, God the Father now treats us as we are in Christ. And for him to let us go, he has to let Jesus go. And he'd never do that. So that's why it's a beautiful thought that the day that you and I get baptized, we are brought into relationship with God. We're brought into the relationship with the Trinity, not just externally, but internally, that we enter into this intimacy with God. We don't become God. Well, again, uh, St. Maximus, the confessor, and different uh, theologians throughout the years talked about when Christ took on humanity, humanity took on divinity. It's called the divinization of man and how we do become like God uh, through the baptism, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and especially when we are baptized. But like right now, if you and I think about it, those of us who are baptized... God, the Trinity, dwells within us, right? Jesus lives inside of us. You know, I no longer live. Jesus lives inside of me. St. Paul says, do you not know that Christ lives inside of you? Then you go to um, uh, the Spirit of the living God. Do you not know that you are temples of the living God? And then you go to Jesus and explicitly in John's gospel. And again, that's why it's so important to meditate on the, the scriptures or we get to to, to spend time with Jesus. And then he talks about the, um, oh, where is it here? But it says, uh, the Father will come and we will make our home in him. Not just the God, Jesus, but God the Father. We will make our home in him. And uh, that is so fantastic when we think about it. I want to give you this ex- great, the explicit verse. We will make our home in them. Um, John fourteen twenty three. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to them and make our home with them or in them. And so... Here in John chapter 14, it, Jesus it goes talks about that, how he'll come and live in us. And when we sit there and we really uh, start believing that, then I think that we'll start living lives differently, right? Because right now we always think of God as up there somewhere instead of God in here somewhere. But... Um, Again, let's go to verse 21 of John chapter 14. Whoever has my commandments, and my commandments are what? Love one another. Whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. That's the way we prove we love God, by loving each other. And whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said, Master, what happened when... What happened that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not uh, love me does not keep my words, yet, yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. So to think that right now you are truly and I am truly a tabernacle of God because of our baptism, that God dwells in us. And I think that sometimes, me too, we think that God dwells in other people. Yesterday, of course, the 25th of January was the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. And like I said in my homily yesterday, if you heard, I think whenever we look at saints, and we almost have in the church a saint worship instead of... uh, You know, it's like, oh, look at them, and we pray to them, and uh, we go to them, and some people go to saints more than they go to God himself, which is a problem. And and we just look at them, and even like our statues of saints, you know, when you look at a statue of the Blessed Mother, none of them 
are the Blessed Mother. The closest we could have of anything would be Our Lady of Guadalupe. Huh? But even that is an image. Like she doesn't look like that now because she's pregnant, right? Uh, so we get glimpses of God. And I mean, glimpses of, the, glimpses of the saints. But most of our statues are just plaster making. Sometimes they look like the saints. Sometimes they do not. But they represent the saints, of course. My issue is this that sometimes we just look at the saints and say, oh, isn't that wonderful that Paul was converted? Isn't that wonderful that that stain had the stigmata? Isn't that wonderful that, they could, uh, that they're incorrupt? Isn't that wonderful that they could uh, uh, bilocate? Isn't it wonderful? And yet we forget what Jesus said. He says, um, I tell you that those of you, I tell you that you'll be able to do the works that I do. That's what Jesus says, and far greater than these. That what happens is when we just do saint worship, or idol, if you will, we forget that that's what we're called to do too. We forget that we're called to a deeper conversion every day. As Paul was converted, so must we be converted. As the saints did all these miracles, God's calling us to do the same. The saints didn't do miracles because of their power, but by grace, because of the power of God living inside of them. Every single saint has the same power that you and I have through baptism, that God lives inside of you and me just as he lived inside of them. Now, often the way we play games in our heads is we say, well, they're saints and I'm not. But if you ask any of the saints, they'd say, oh, no, I'm the greatest sinner. Paul, you know, last night when I put the, uh, my tweet out last night and Instagram, I'd say, it says, you know, Paul says the worst of sinners. He called himself the worst of sinners. And then I said, and you thought you were the worst of sinners? Paul said he was the worst of sinners. Huh? And... In spite of all this, God used him to bring the world to his son, Jesus. In spite of your sinfulness and my sinfulness, God wants to use us. We need to get out of the way and surrender and let the world see Jesus. Let the world experience the Father through us, the Father's love through us. To let the world experience the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. But often we call this this false humility, as I've talked about many times, where I'm not worthy. Of course you're not worthy. None of us are worthy. Paul wasn't worthy. Any of the saints weren't worthy. But they surrendered more. And the more they surrendered, the more God could use them. So again, by virtue of baptism, this power is called to be inside of you. Today, as we record this, we're recording it on the Feast of St. Timothy and Titus. And again, they were both bishops and they were uh, priests, of course. And I love it because sometimes us priests and some bishops, excuse me, um, think that they don't need anything, that they're pretty much together, which is the uh, worst of arrogance and pride. You know, there ain't much God can do with someone who thinks that way. Um, and he just can't, no matter how powerful you are in the church. He can't use people that are filled with themselves. He can only use people who are filled with humility and focus all on God and want to be an instrument of God. Um, now, again, God can still use people. He used a jackass to speak to <laughs> Balaam, you know, <laughs> to speak to the prophet in the Old Testament. So he can still use them. But when we live in humility uh, and when we remember what happened, so here Paul, again today, talking in... Uh, in the scriptures to his Timothy. Now again, remember Timothy was a bishop and priest, and here he reminds him. And I, again, if you've uh, not read my book, Be a Man, which I'm guessing if you're watching this, most of you have, have read it. But if you haven't, if you go here, I spend in these two verses, I, I said one verse this morning, but it's the two verses, that I spend four chapters of my book on these two verses of scripture and he's talking to timothy and he says um, oh chapter uh two, two timothy chapter one verse six 
For this reason, I remind you to stir into a flame the gift of God that, was, that you have through the imposition of hands, of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power, love, and self-control. So he's reminding Timothy, bishop, priest, that when I gave you the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands, that could be ordination, confirmation, baptism, you have to use the gift that God gave you through the imposition of my hands, which is the Holy Spirit, and stir that into a flame. Huh? And so, if, again, this morning in my tweet, I sat there and I quoted this verse and I said, so, do you daily, daily stir into a flame the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you? And again, so people, too many people say yes too fast and I'll say, uh, how? Question mark. So to make people start thinking, well, how am I doing that? And then I say peace, as I always do. And then in my God, the, 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 by homily today, I explained that. That means we need to say a prayer to the Holy Spirit every day, a prayer of surrender to the Holy Spirit, that we really surrender our hearts and our lives to God's Spirit, that we let Him take full control of us. Not the Spirit who's out there, but the Spirit that's in here so that God can use us and truly make us His temple, so that God can bring other people to him through us. So again, it's the power doesn't come from us. The power comes from God. What does come from us is our cowardice. Huh? And he says, that's why the spirit that God has given you isn't a cowardly spirit. But the new translation says of power, love, and self-control. The, 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 four, the three chapters of my book after we talk about the need for the Holy Spirit is that, um, that the, the gift that God gives us is not a spirit of fear or cowardice, but love, of uh, uh, power, uh, love, and self-control, or the old thing was makes us strong, loving, and wise. And so when we focus on ourselves and our sinfulness, we feel like fear, uh, cowards. But when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, we are strong, power, we are loving, and we are wise. That's all the gift of God. So in our daily life, we have to surrender to the power that was given to us at our baptism. There's great power there. We forget it, and we don't surrender enough to it. So we just see Christianity or being Catholic as uh, going through the motions, trying to live a good life, following the commandments, and it's, it's, it's much more than that. It's allowing God to take full control of our lives. And again, we forget about that. Timothy did. I do. And that's why Paul had to remind him. And as I often do when I'm preaching, I always say, now know this. I'm preaching to myself first and then preaching to you. That means the Spirit of God convicts me first and then I convict everybody else. But it's not like, oh, yeah, you got to start doing this. And I sit there and say, oh, I've already done that. No, no, no. God's calling us both to always remember that, but to know that there's such great power from the moment we're baptized. There is an ontological change that happens at baptism. You know what ontological means? It's a change of being. Our very being is transformed. That a soul that is baptized is different than a soul that is not baptized. There isn't that ontological change. Grace is still there. If there wasn't grace in someone that wasn't baptized, they could never experience baptism because only by grace can someone be saved can they even come to know faith can they even come to know jesus so somehow there's a grace there not in the traditional sense the way we talk it but god is present period of course he is or they couldn't even convert you know years ago i was talking to a, a group and i talked about how god uh, stays with us and he loves us and no 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 father and we when we go into mortal sin god leaves us and i says well if he left us then we couldn't convert we could never come to repentance because the only way we come to repentance isn't by our power, but by the grace of God. So somehow God is always present. But when we're baptized, he's not just present like here, I'm standing next to you. He's present like here, I'm living inside of you. And when we start to know that power and we start looking at the God who lives within us, not in a, again, we're not God, but we're temples of God. And then I decide that instead of living my life of fear, 
living my life of sin. I'm going to let God take control of my life. But what we got to do is open the gift. That's why, like when I do any kind of uh, parish mission or if I do a confirmation retreat or I do one of my DME retreats, I always have a surrender of your life to God. Now, when I was in Ireland, Dublin, uh, what, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, whatever it was, I, I, spoke, I spoke at Glock Noise, which, of course, I never say right. And the Dominican there, one of the greatest guys ever. Uh, we had to, Jesus out in the Blessed Sacrament 24 hours on the monstrance and the, uh, so kids could spear. They, was, they spent the whole week from all over Ireland, all the kids from Northern Ireland, all of Ireland was there. And I was the speaker. They had to listen to me all weekend, those poor kids. And so when I did the surrender of my, uh, our lives to Jesus, the priest hate, hated it. He just says, I just don't get it. We do it at baptism. We do do it at baptism. But the problem is, is that someone else's faith was used to have you baptized normally if you were baptized as a child. But again, faith needs to unlock the gift. And so the faith of our parents and godparents unlocked the gift when we were baptized, hopefully. But we still, we were given a gift that day, the gift of eternal life, the gift of God's Trinity, God himself. And for most people, even after they're baptized, the gift is there, but unopened. Let's say I give you a, a gift of a million dollars. And you know it's a million dollars, I've told you. But it's wrapped up. And you never unwrap the gift. And you die of starvation. You had the gift. You had the money. You just never opened it up. When we were baptized, we were given a gift. But we need to open that gift ourselves in our lives. And that comes when we surrender our life to God, when we give full control to God. So again, if you have never given that, yourself surrendered yourself completely to God, you need to do that. I'll never forget, you know, I came to Christ when I was 16 or 17 by watching Billy Graham and he had the altar calls without an altar, I know. And, uh, but at least started me on being in a relationship with Jesus. Now that's without the sacraments and everything else, but it was just, okay, at least I gotta, I gotta uh, begin this thing. But then I still hadn't done it completely. I still lived my life. And even when I went to seminary, it was a life of fear. Uh, I thought that because of someone like me, God the Father couldn't put up with me for too long. Um, and so if I was a priest and I was still a virgin, still am, that God would say, okay, you're one of the few people that uh, did that, so I'll keep you alive forever. So it was like a bargaining chip with God. Okay, I'll go do this, I'll go be a priest, and uh, you gotta love me and you gotta take care of me. But it wasn't a surrender of love. It was a surrender of selfishness and fear. And so later on in seminary, I remember I was at St. Mark's and uh, I used to spend four hours a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And I was there one Saturday and I spent, well, in that morning, I think I spent six or seven hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament that day. I'll never forget me kneeling there in front of Jesus and then I said, Jesus, no matter what this means, I completely and fully surrender my life completely to you that you, even if that means whatever damnation or eternal life, whatever, Jesus, I completely surrender my life to you and I ask you to take full control of my life. And he did. It's more than just being baptized and trying to live a good life. It's allowing the God, opening that gift that was given to you by the church, at baptism, opening that gift yourself through faith when you surrender yourself forever to God, when you make that act of faith, then the spirit that God is giving you isn't a cowardly spirit or a spirit of fear, but one that will make you strong, loving, and wise. 
And that's what we all need to get to. So if you have never in your own prayer, not with me, not on TV, you and Jesus, you and the Father, you and the Spirit, fully, completely surrender yourself to God. Open the gift that the church gave you the day you were baptized. Open it for yourself and watch the reality of what God can do. Huh? So again, we talked about baptism and I talk more, not as a theologian, but how do you live baptism? And that's what I'm going to do with each of the sacraments. If you want a deep uh, theology of baptism, you go to the catechism. You can go to someone like Scott Hahn. And sometimes when we just do that, it's a head knowledge. And I don't think head knowledge is enough. Now, some people will say, yes, it is. Go for it. I said, I don't think head knowledge is enough. It has to be heart knowledge. It has to be relational. The God of the universe created us to be in relationship with us. And he wants you and me to be in relationship with him. And so often we just stay so focused on ourselves and our sinfulness and we can't even begin to think that God would love us. And yet God didn't have to create you. He not only created you, he loved you enough to have you baptized, to enter into intimate relationship with you. And so I just think it's sad that some people never open the gift in their lives. They just go through the motions, go to Mass on Sunday, try to uh, do good and avoid evil, try to keep the Ten Commandments, try to be a good person, instead of just living a loving relationship with the God of the universe and his people. So pray about it. Surrender. Open the gift of your baptism that you can live a life not of fear, but one that will make you strong, loving, and wise. And it will keep you alive forever. You got it? You get it? Are you going to do it? <laughs> Made sure you know his love today and forever. Amen. Thank you for watching. I uh, know I pray for you every day and that I love you and I ask you to please pray for me. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. He who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.